So Art Smith, who is our moderator for this first speech tonight, is a young man who gave up a very successful business career to get into the work of the church with Dr. McBurney and into the fight for America, and has been doing a terrific job, both through his voice, as he's an excellent trained singer, his business acumen and administrative ability, and a delightful personality to make it all the more effective. So we're delighted to have Art Smith with us here tonight. Thank you, Colonel Bunker. Normally, when I'm introduced here in the ballroom, I'm accustomed to coming in and picking up, picking up a microphone and doing a song. But tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend, a friend who also happens to be truly a dedicated champion of God, family, and country. I might add he's also a friend who gave us a few anxious moments this afternoon because his plane just arrived barely 45 minutes ago. This man is well known to those of us who are fortunate enough, enough to be able to view his weekly 90-minute television program on Channel 5 in Los Angeles. It's the Robert K. Dornan Show. And previous to this discussion show, Bob hosted Tempo, which was a daily four-hour talk show for which he won Emmys both in 1968 and 69. Prior to that, he co-starred on the widely acclaimed television series, 12 O'Clock High. Bob Dornan is the kind of fellow that doesn't hesitate to go where angels fear to tread. Just recently, in the midst of 200,000 Washington, D.C. demonstrators, that was on April 24th of this year, Bob conducted film interviews with Viet Cong flag-carrying militants. During the interviews, several of these dissidents ripped down the American flag and chanted slogans calling for a Hanoi Viet Cong triumph over South Vietnamese and the U.S. forces. Unwilling to stand by and see his country debased and its flag defiled, Bob proceeded on se separate occasions through the long day to take five Viet Cong flags by force. He ripped apart He ripped apart each one in full view of enraged radical demonstrators, and in spite of being threatened with a gun and a knife, Bob talked them down and faced them down. A week later, on May 2nd, he again stood up for America, in the same way at the Jane Fonda Donald Sutherland rally in Los Angeles Exposition Park. Films of these interviews were aired on Bob's program where viewers were shown all sides of the so-called peaceful peace demonstrations. Bob has an international reputation as a champion of the prisoner of war and missing in action families. He has traveled twice around the globe with the wives and mothers of these men to focus world opinion on the inhum inhumanity of the North Vietnamese against 1,600 families and many hundreds of individual prisoners now suffering behind the bamboo curtain. Also, Bob has devoted nine of his full-hour programs to this cause, featuring POW MIA relatives, government officials concerned with the POW MIA, and several formal, former POWs who were either released or escaped from the enemy. Needless to say, Bob Dornan is our kind of man, and it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce him to you, Mr. Robert K. Dornan. Thank you, Art, for that very nice introduction. I thank you for inviting me to come and bring a message to this rally concerning what I think is the greatest tragedy in the entire history of our nation. And that's the tragedy that confronts us in Southeast Asia today, of American citizens sitting in communist cells in North Vietnam at the bottom of pits, living in their own excrement, fed once a day in Laos, 
and caged like animals with their hands and legs shackled in South Vietnam. The impact of this tragedy can only be brought home to the average American when you try and put it into some sort of relative time perspective. World War I, in which my father was a combat officer in France, and into which we went totally unprepared, lasted one year and seven months from the time of our American entry. Less than that if you consider our emergence in force on the battlefields of Europe. World War II, into which again we went unprepared, having totally disarmed in the intervening years between the two great world conflicts, and but for one single congressional vote in 1940, we would not have even had the small standing army and draft that we had when the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. And yet to crush fascism, warlord Tojo, Mussolini, and Adolf Hitler, it took an unprepared nation, this nation, three years and nine months. Then we found ourselves, before five years had passed, in our first undeclared, no win, no victory war, the conflict in Korea. And in spite of the fact that we lost 33,629 American young men killed and thousands upon thousands wounded paraplegics, amputees, we managed to bring a cessation to the heavy fighting to a conclusion in three years and one month, although young men still die there on a regular basis each year in border incidents along the 38th parallel. That heavy fighting ended in three years and one month. Now, if you add the length of World War I, World War II, and the Korean War together, you get a period of eight years and five months. And on New Year's Eve of this very year, just a few months hence, there will be seven young Americans beginning their eighth year of captivity, 135 beginning their seventh year of captivity, and 427 citizens serving us, duty, honor, and country, their credo, 427 beginning their sixth year. There are five Christian Bible civilian, Bible translators, that are already in their ninth year. There is a civilian, Jean de Bruin, that has passed that magic figure of eight years and five months, the total course of World War I, World War II, and the Korean War. He passed it months ago. He begins his ninth year next month. The first naval pilot to be shot down during the Tonkin Gulf incident begins his eighth year on the fifth of next month, only a few short weeks away. Now, if any one of you in your youth had been told that this nation, represented by its embassies around the world with that great eagle emblazoned on our crest, would sit by and watch the best of its young American citizens serving their country in uniform or serving God as a, as a man who tried to, men and women, I might add, who tried to bring some sort of solace and comfort to a nation beset with war and problems, that we would watch these citizens, civilian and military, rot in communist cells for periods like this. It would, I'm sure, have been absolutely inconceivable that the United States would ever fall into a situation like this. Now, most people don't realize that we have five men that are imprisoned in Red China that we know of. In this part of the country, with its Irish-American heritage, the names Flynn and Downey and Dunn should have special significance. Richard Fechtu and John Downey are in their 19th year of imprisonment in Red China. 19 years serving their country during the Korean War, and these are acknowledged prisoners, acknowledged the way Bishop Walsh was acknowledged, who was released to this area of the country because of poor health, really because another American citizen had died in communist captivity in China, in Red China, 
in his 17th year. Now, in the program for this rally, the title of my remarks to you are titled Pro-Hanoi Bias in the Media. And I would like to make that more or less a, a subtitle or a sub-subject to this prisoner of war and missing an action problem because the solution or one of the solutions to the problem lies with the media. And the media in this country, both printed and electronic, and when I say electronic, the, the weight of that falls on the shoulders of the television industry, the electronic medium that involves ABC, CBS, and NBC, much more so than radio, because this is now one of the most important movers and shapers of our society. I am a media creature. I have lived within this particular profession for most of the professional years of my adult life. And I can tell you because of those nine critically important letters to the American citizenry, ABC, CBS, and NBC, this nation is in a sick condition. I'll read you some words from the floor of the Congress of the United States just within the last few days. But before I do, I'd like to hold up a front page from a printed publication in Los Angeles called Variety. It's called a trade paper. It's the journal that most people working in television or in motion pictures or radio read to find out what one another is up to. And in this particular front page article, dated November 26, 1969, the president of the most powerful of the three networks, Frank Stanton, says that the remarks of Vice President Agnew concerning bias in the media is the worst peril since the founding of our republic. Nice of him to use the word republic. The worst peril since the founding of the republic. Television is an awesome power that can control America. If we can't do something about it, I think the era of Big Brother has arrived. Now those words are not Dr. Frank Stanton's words. Those are the words of the chairman of a subcommittee of the Commerce Committee of the House of Representatives, Representative Staggers. And it involves a television documentary called The Selling of the Pentagon, which was first aired earlier this spring and then aired again in April and then critiqued again a few weeks later. Three runs out of one particular television documentary. And Staggers has asked that the president of CBS be held in contempt of Congress for refusing to bring in the research material and the outtakes of this particular documentary. Now, what intervened between the time that Dr. Stanton accused Vice President Agnew of bringing about the worst peril to this country since the founding of the Republic and Staggers, Representative Staggers' remarks that television is an awesome power that control, can control America? Well, I think if we use the words of one of the top anchormen and commentators on television in this country, that some light will be shed on this problem that should be devoid of ideological bias or political gain. Many of you may recall a disgraceful television program nine years ago called The Political Obituary of Richard Nixon. It was hosted and in great part written by a man named Howard K. Smith. And it took a, an American citizen that had served his country for three and a half years or more in the United States Navy, and then entered Congress and served his country there for four years, and then became a senator from one of the most populous states in the Union for two years, and then went on to serve his country honorably for eight years as a vice president of the United States. And instead of getting a president, President Dwight Eisenhower, under which this man had served, or one of his colleagues in the Senate, Howard K. Smith, got a man who was looked down upon by most Americans and who had gone to jail as a convicted perjurer and had been one of the architects of selling countries out and into communist slavery, 
a man who was better named than any man possibly since Quisling, a man named Alger Hiss. Hiss was the man that Howard K. Smith sought out to comment on the life of an American who had served his country so many years, Richard Nixon, the current president of our country. So Howard K. Smith is a man who has long, well-established liberal credentials, as they say in the media. And here's what Howard K. Smith said in a recent TV Guide article that went absolutely uncommented upon in the electronic medium. There is a network news bias. This is dated February 28th of 1970. Howard K. Smith, and I only quote in part from an incredible article, says political bias in TV reporting is of such a magnitude that it fully justifies the explosion we have seen among our people. The political composition of the network staffs is that they are almost exclusively staffed by liberals. And liberals virtually by definition have a strong leftward bias. Our tradition since Roosevelt has been to the left. I am left of center myself, says Smith. But my liberal friends today have become dogmatic. They have a set of automatic reactions. They react the way political cartoonists do. They oversimplify. The presidency, the presidency of our country, including that of Lyndon Johnson, was politically assassinated. And that same thinking is waiting to be applied to Richard Nixon. They hate the president irrationally, and they intend to assassinate him politically. He goes on to analyze the media's bias against conservatives, against many of the groups represented here today. And then he picks out the subject of Russia. He says, some liberals have gone overboard in a wish to believe that our opponent has exclusively peaceful aims, and that there is no need for armaments and national security. The danger of Russian aggression is unreal to most of them, although some have begun to rethink since the invasion of Czechoslovakia. It goes without saying, I guess, that Hungary had no impact upon them at all. Ho Chi Minh, many have described Ho Chi Minh as a nationalist leader comparable to George Washington. So did congressmen, by the way, on the floor of our house. In Hanoi in 1954, his regime was marked by the murder of 50,000 of his own people, and this was uncommented upon. This is Howard K. Smith writing these words. The Viet Cong massacred 3,000 Vietnamese at Way alone. A footnote here is that figure is now updated to 5,700 in the slaughter that took place at Way. A massacre that dwarfs all allegations about Mi Lai. And this was never reported upon. And it has been my experience in the media, by the way, when this issue comes up, that they now dismiss these deaths in way as deaths that were accomplished in the heat of battle as the American Marines and the 101st Airborne closed in. And I would just like to add here for the record the writings of Douglas Pike, one of the experts on the Viet Cong in Southeast Asia. Quote, Mr. Pike, Despite appearances, virtually no killing was due to rage, frustration, or panic during the communist withdrawal at the end. Quite the contrary, to trace back any single killing is to discover almost without exception that it was the result of a decision, rational and justifiable, even imperative, in the communist mind. And on this type of massive slaughter, particularly when you put it alongside of the unbelievable ad nauseum reporting on the massacre at My Lai, 102 people involved there, to totally disregard 5,700 people slaughtered or the flamethrower killings at the small village of Dok San, I think is criminal negligence. And Howard K. Smith, to quote him again, says that way was never reported upon. He goes on to document the bias in favor of militants, radicals in this country, and Smith zeroes in on the new left. The new left challenges America. They're rewriting the history of the Cold War. Some carry around the Viet Cong flag. 
Some shout for Mao, people who would be assassinated in China. Yet they're not portrayed as irrational. Reporters describe them as our children. Well, they're not my children. My children don't throw bags of excrement at policemen. If right-wing students had done what the left-wing students have done and are doing, everyone, including the reporters, would have called in the police and asked that their heads be beaten in. But we have a left-wing bias now that has 30 years of momentum behind it. And I might add that one of the significant factors in Mr. Smith's life that turned him around from that horrible show of 1962 involving President Nixon to today may be that one of his sons served honorably as an army officer in the Ai Drang Valley of South Vietnam. And when Howard K. Smith's son's unit was overrun, he pretended to be dead as he watched North Vietnamese troops in uniform work their way through the wounded American men, bayoneting every one of them to death. It was a miracle that Smith's son survived, and Smith went over to Vietnam to visit with him in the hospital. And this fine army officer's son said, why don't you stay around, Dad, and see what's really taking place here. And that was the turning around of Howard K. Smith. He comes to one of the most important lines in this entire amazing piece in TV Guide. The new left, says Smith, has acquired a grave power over the liberal mind. And if I could continue that sentence, that means the new left has acquired a grave power over the minds that control ABC, CBS, and NBC. And it's been stated not once, but consistently, that most Americans, most Americans, glean most of their facts about what's happening throughout the world in their own country or in their own communities, not from the printed media, but from the electronic media, particularly television. Smith continues on this issue of anti-American and pro-New Left bias in the network news departments, that my observations are identical to some of those coming from the right, where conservatives are often inclined to see this pattern as a deliberate conscience conscious and intellectually potent conspiracy, Mr. Smith says that it is largely an unconscious phenomenon stemming from intellectual impotence and qualities such as conformism, hypocrisy, self-deception, and stupidity. And I would like to add to that unbelievable arrogance. He says he attributes this to a mental vacuum in the liberal world. These men cling to the label liberal and they cling to those who seem strong, namely the new left or the nude left, as some would call them. There's a gravitation to them by liberals who are not sure of themselves and it is this new left power over many of the nation's liberal reporters that underlies an anti-American and a pro-radical and I add a pro-Hanoi bias in network coverage, and that is what underlies public anger. Howard K. Smith says to let public protest rip, and he thinks that public protest is going to knock back into contact with reality these men. I would let public opinion and the utterances of the, the alleged silent majority bring about a corrective. The corrective, just a simple attempt to be fair. Now, this article is a year and six months old. Thousands of young Americans have died on the battlefields of Asia since this article came out. And what we've seen since this article was published is not less of this or public protest knocking these men back into reality, but an unbelievable arrogance, as I said, flying in the face of everything written by one of the longest commentators on television. As of this present moment, he is the anchor man with Harry Reasoner of the ABC evening newscast, but rather a direct and deliberate heading in the exact opposite direction from the course that media should have taken following the remarks of the Vice President of the United States and the wave of public support backing up those who said they were sick and tired of this unfairness in the media. 
Now this great tragedy that I spoke of, the prisoner in war missing an action problem, is the easiest way for any American citizen to focus in on this ugly and blatant bias in the media. Some of you may have seen the two-hour documentaries produced by CBS last week and the week before called POW's Pawns of War. I think that the selling of the Pentagon, as bad as it was, in that they had used tricks and devices that when used by game shows years back caused a tremendous scandal and the destruction of men's careers. But now when we're involved with the survival of the free world, literally the survival of mankind, suddenly the trickery involved in game shows is not to be applied or the same standard of of excellence or the same standard demanded of the electronic media which uses the publicly owned airways, those same standards of discipline are not to be applied suddenly to CBS. But as bad as the selling of the Pentagon was, I think the special agony involved with American families who have not seen their father or son or husband for almost an entire decade, that special tragedy of the psychological torture of American children and wives and mothers and brothers and sisters, that has made these two CBS Hour documentaries actually criminal in the biased approach that was used by this major American network in approaching this problem. In this particular case, as in no other case, I can speak from first-hand knowledge. The most glaring and insulting part of the entire two hours, and I might add that in this continuing, ongoing eight-year problem, NBC has not devoted one single minute of documentary time to this problem. ABC, to their minuscule credit, did one acceptable half hour last fall, prompted probably by the raid into Sante by courageous American Green Berets and Rangers and Air Force personnel to try and extract some of our prisoners on November 21st. Now, the CBS network for eight years took a posture of silence and they broke their silence with these two hours only to title them out of the mouth of Swan Tree, the top communist negotiator at Paris. He charged President Nixon last month with using the prisoner issue and using the men as pawns, hence the title of CBS's two-hour documentary, Pawns of War. They admitted this themselves in the opening five minutes of the first hour. Now, in the second hour, they charged that every, excuse me, most, an accuracy of words that the networks don't apply when they talk about all young people in this country adhering to a certain standard, or all young people wanting marijuana legalized, instead of using the word some. I'll try not to be guilty of that playing around with adjectives. The exact quote out of Walter Cronkite, the paid host and narrator of both hours, was that most American groups, and by implication individuals, who are trying to help the POW missing an action cause, are initiated and orchestrated by the administration. And that is a damnable lie. I don't know of one, of one single group across this country that is initiated or orchestrated by the administration of our government in trying to help these men imprisoned in this intolerable situation in Asia. Walter Cronkite, at another point, in these unbelievable two hours, tried to make the point that President Nixon deliberately brings up the POW issue at every press conference just to use it as a wedge to delay our staying in Southeast Asia and along the same thinking of Senator Kennedy of this state that he's doing it only to get himself reelected a year from November. And the very fact that President Nixon mentions the POWs at press conferences 
is because the family members across this country and their friends have forced the President of the United States into that position. As I did myself at a press conference in Los Angeles on April, excuse me, July 30th of 1970, almost a year ago, it was my one and only press conference. And if you've ever seen one of those on television, everyone jumps up and down like little jacks in boxes to try and catch the president's attention. And I caught his eye and I asked him about the 389 American prisoners, acknowledged prisoners that were left behind in Korea and whether or not he had given a special briefing to Ambassador K.E. Bruce, who was then on his way to Paris to head the negotiating team for our country. The president then responded. Had I not asked that question, there would have been no discussions of the prisoners of war at that particular press conference because the, the average correspondent at one of those conferences doesn't have the time to worry about our men in Asia. They're so busy nitpicking about problems that they think can embarrass the president. Now that has been the case at most of his press conferences. He has met with family members close enough to that press conference where they have asked President Nixon to make some statement so that they would not have to feel that their men were forgotten. And the entire two hours of this documentary is loaded with one distortion after another, the most cruel of which is the fact that with all of the courageous wives around this country and mothers who have traveled to find out some shred of mercy about their husbands or sons, whether or not they were widows themselves, whether or not their sons were alive or dead or dying, women that have traveled to meet with Pope Paul VI, and I was there when the first group met with the Pope, behind the Iron Curtain into Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, into Moscow itself where Four wives and I were locked inside an old hotel and the weather was 15 degrees below zero and were treated in a most unbelievably rude manner by the government of the Soviet Union. I've watched these women argue with more skill and sheer courage and guts is the word than many congressmen on the or senators on the floor of our house argue with communists in their own embassies in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, Vientiane, Laos and the aforementioned communist countries. And not one of these courageous mothers or wives was sought out to take part in this documentary. But rather, CBS went out of their way to find a handful of women who are anti-administration. And even though they are entitled to their viewpoint and entitled to speak out when CBS comes to them, it was CBS's responsibility and it was easily determined to find out just what percentage this angry group of dissident wives represented out of the 1,600 families that are involved. And it's probably less than 10%, closer to less than 5%. And then CBS, in presenting these various angry wives, didn't even have the journalistic courtesy to identify the women that were speaking on camera. We have in television an instrument that's called a videograph, and it runs a name or a title underneath someone's face. And to put five, six, seven, eight, nine women in a row and not identify one of them is not only wrong, it's bad journalism. And CBS, to my knowledge, has not been challenged on these two documentaries except by family members themselves around this country in press conferences the following morning of the the morning following the second documentary, and when television has the ability to ignore the women in these press conferences the following day as they did, it only accentuates what Representative Stagger says about the awesome power of television and its influence on our lives today. This is not the tail end of the Industrial Revolution, or in spite of our magnificent achievements in outer space, this is not the space age, this is not the nuclear age. This is the age of communications. And in a free society, when a small group of men who all live relatively within the same area of the country, attend the same cocktail parties, and interchange the same ideas, 
and have an unwritten code of brotherhood where when one network is attacked, the other two back up the third one when their jobs should be, as newspapers do, to form a check and balance on one another, to ferret out mistakes in broadcasting on one another's part, rather than to hang together with one voice every time someone dares to have the effrontery to suggest that, one, they are not only not representative of the majority of the citizens of this country, but they are distorting the news to the younger citizens of this country in such a way that we see a rampant radicalism in our country that anyone would have dreamed impossible just five or ten years ago. And I submit to you that it is my analysis that the reason so many young people in this country are turned on to hardcore evil is that the media of this country has either deliberately glorified those evils or turned their back on the reporting job of exposing the dangers. We have in this country now a situation where the terrifying word epidemic is thrown around so loosely you would think no one had looked up the import and horror of its meaning in the dictionary within the last five years. We have an epidemic of runaway children, an epidemic of unwed motherhood, pro-abortion doctors, doctors who believe in abortion on demand, themselves have said at their conventions that were abortion to be a disease, we would have an epidemic across this country of abortion. And the two horrible epidemics are the ones that involve venereal disease and drug abuse. Venereal disease in this country can no longer be called an epidemic. I learned a new medical word. Those of you in the medical field have known it all of your lives. Pandemic. It means worldwide raging out of control epidemic. I learned that one just a few months ago. And if you've seen the cover of this week's Newsweek magazine, you see that heroin is now being described as a plague. A plague of heroin and a pandemic situation with venereal disease. And where was the media when these epidemics were building? Were they putting a cover on Newsweek and pointing attention to the fact that we might have a plague building? No, on the contrary, they were glorifying Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix on their covers. Talented young musicians that both overdosed at the age of 27 on drugs or heroin, throwing away their God-given talent, but before they went down the tube to use the current vernacular, they took an awful lot of young people with them by glorifying the evil that was rampant across our country. There isn't a community in this country where you can't easily identify the child corruptors. All you have to do is find the local pornography store or look at the motion picture product that's presented to the cynically described youth market in our country and there you can find the people that Christ spoke of so specifically in the New Testament when he warned about causing one of these little ones who believe in me to sin and gave the advice that it would be better to tie a millstone around your neck than corrupt these little ones who believe in me. But is the media in this country attempting to tie a journalistic millstone around anyone's neck? They are not. On the contrary, either by omission or by design, they defend at every turning the child corruptors and they use the First Amendment of our beautiful Constitution to do it. People can sell top secret documents openly and the very newspapers that just a few short years ago were condemning Senator Joseph McCarthy for encouraging federal employees to have loyalty to their government over and above any superior, and if they found graft, corruption, or traitorism, to make it known, the same papers, the New York Times and the Washington Post, that condemned in the most severe terms Senator Joseph McCarthy, now turn around and praise under the people's right to know 
the selling of top secret documents so that every country around this world that considered us a friend now shakes in terror that their confidential written discourses with this country may be next. Now, if there was never an issue that was as plain as this POW issue to focus in on the bias of the media, if there was ever an issue that you as American citizens could rally around to demand fairness, then this is it. And I can tell you that there's going to come a day in this country, ladies and gentlemen, when the news magazines and the Times and the Washington Post and ABC, CBS and NBC are going to be falling all over themselves in an ugly manner to take photographs of young sons and daughters looking up into the eyes of an emaciated, skinny daddy that they had never seen before in all of their seven or eight or nine years of existence on this planet Earth. The cameras will jam in rudely and push people out of the way to catch the tears streaming down the face of a young bride who only knew her husband for a week before he disappeared five and six and seven and eight years ago. Terror in her heart that the love that they knew so well may no longer be there. Or to come crashing in to catch the tears flowing down the face of a man crying in public because he's looking into the face of a wife of 10 or 15 or 20 years where the, the rock-solid stature of that love had been established and looks at the face of his beloved that he hadn't seen for five or six or seven years. Then you'll see the cover on Life magazine. Then you'll see the cover on Time and Newsweek. Then you'll see them trying to publish for a brief moment only then the agony of these families. But when these families screamed out five and four and three years ago for some help, a deaf ear was turned their way. When they went to the administration and begged that administration, the new administration, to go public on this, many months of thought had to go into that for fear that the government would be accused of using the pathos and the horror of this situation to political gain. And then when the administration was finally moved in the right direction, the administration now gets the very thing they feared thrown in its face, that they are not only instigating and initiating every move on the part of American people to help these men, but they are orchestrating their every move, our every move. And I resent it personally, I resent it collectively for everyone that's worked so hard, and I resent it for those of you that have done nothing to help our men in Asia. And I'll tell you why I resent it for you who have done nothing. Because you can't move on a problem, ladies and gentlemen, until you're made aware of that problem. And in this free country, the people who are supposed to impart the news to you have failed you. Because if these networks hadn't sat on the color film that you saw two weeks ago of young American kids being kicked and spit on and urinated on, dragged through the streets at bayonet point with their burns still raw, bones sticking through bandages and blood running freely from their wounds. If CBS hadn't sat on that color film for three years, there would have been an explosion in this country like we've never seen. They got that film out of communist countries like East Germany, and they ran little bits and pieces of it. They ran some of it in black and white that was available in color. And I guess they decided it was just too much for this country to bear. And they already had an ideological or political viewpoint about this war. And if it didn't fit into their preconceived, as Howard Smith would say, liberal vision of things, then it wasn't to be aired. And they could have informed every one of you in this room in such a way years ago that these men would not be in the sad condition they're in today and they are still kept in solitary confinement, most of them. Don't be fooled by Walter Cronkite mouthing that maybe the conditions are better because of a phony communist show camp with 15 men or more playing basketball. When there are 300 men that we've never seen that have been there over four and five years, 
And when the communists tell us that the official list is in, 339 men and that's it, and 20 have died in their camps. And we know through photographic evidence, communist photographic evidence, that these communist fools released themselves in French papers in Paris like Le Monde of men like Commander Dodge. Photographic evidence that he's alive and a prisoner and now they say they never heard of him. And beyond that there are 29 names specifically identified by the nine returned prisoners from North Vietnam. They drilled holes in their wall. They looked through the holes. They watched through cracks in the wall who was taking a shower. They memorized their names. And by methods I can't tell you because I still happen to respect the words secret and top secret and confidential. Through other forms of American ingenuity, they memorized upwards of 50, and in one case, 100 names of men that they had seen physically in the camps. And 29 of those men are not identified as being prisoners. And this problem is nothing of the men not identified that we know they have compared to the missing in action situation in Laos, or the civilians or the men in South Vietnam that have been dragged from cage to cage like Major Nick Rowe who escaped after five years. None of these men have been invited on the Johnny Carson show, the Dick Cavett show, the Merv Griffin show, or the David Frost show. Contrary to that, they'll have a pathetic fool of a girl whose father's married five times over and whose mother committed suicide. A young girl who was the first one to expose her her female parts to a motion picture camera, and it was now this very month at a theater around the block from here in a film called Clute, using the ultimate Anglo-Saxon obscenity that begins with F six times in the film, the first time out of the mouth of a person of star stature. I'm talking about Jane Fonda. This pathetic girl who said at Ohio State that if you knew what communism was, you students, would get down on your knees and pray that someday we would become communists, and she got a standing ovation at Ohio State. And this girl, Jane Fonda, is given 90 minutes uninterrupted on the Merv Griffin show to spew out her pathetic communist propaganda. She looked at my very face once in California and said, my heroes are Ho Chi Minh, a murder of 60,000 of his own people. Mao, who may go down as one of the mass murderers of all time in history, and Kim Il-sung of Korea. These are my heroes, she told me to my face. And she's given an hour on the David Frost show, an hour on the Dick Cavett show, and 90 minutes on Merv Griffin, and they haven't had one return POW, let alone a decorated man from, from Vietnam to set the record straight until this last week when Dick Cavett was forced to have on John O'Neill because of people like yourselves writing in. And John O'Neill from Texas destroyed, I'm sorry to say, your naval officer from Massachusetts named John Kerry, a man who, sold his, who has sold his soul to the Viet Cong flag-carrying rabble in this country for political gain to run for the congressional seat that Father Drynan was the victor in. And I guess he has other political ambitions for the next go around. So he'll say or do anything, including trying to smear with one big brush two and a half million veterans and make them all out to be war criminals and murderers. Now there is something that you can do, and you can use this POW issue as a specific point of reference. You can take up the pen, which I happen to believe is mightier than the sword. And I know that most of you in this auditorium come from an array of groups across this country that have been doing this very thing over the years. To a better degree, to a greater degree, I guess, than any other groups in the country. So maybe the only function I can perform here is one of boosting your morale or telling you that it is important and does count. And the only thing I can tell you is that there is no way to calculate the power of a well-written, concise, tight letter if it involves the power of what's almost a secret word, carbon copy. If you send a letter to every sponsor of the network programs that distort and that create this incredible situation of bias to the sponsors and let the people like Dr. Frank Stanton of CBS and Richard Salant who may alone result in the respelling of the word slant in the English language, where we'll have to add an A between the first S and L. 
If you write to these sponsors and let Richard Salant and Dr. Stanton and the other men at the networks and the radio stations get that eighth or ninth carbon copy, when they see that other copies are going to congressmen and sponsors, I can only tell you from years and years of experience that the impact of one letter is incredible. And I have never seen a situation involving some radical on television where more than four or five well-written, intelligent letters with a tremendous array of carbon copies has come in. Before I worked for the current sponsorship that has me on the air now, the owner of our station is a fine patriotic American, Gene Autry. I worked at a station that was owned by a man who began, I think, in this part of the country. He's a papal knight of Malta. He owns five television stations and the maximum radio stations across this country. And yet he knew so little about what was happening at his television station in Los Angeles that twice I was kicked off my own stage for radicals who got on there and unchallenged poisoned the mind of the young kids that were watching because it was daytime and coincidentally both days were school holidays. And one of those two radicals languishes in a cell in Marin County. Her name is Angela Davis. And the other languishes, thank heavens, in a cell in Switzerland. His name is Timothy Leary. And as he sat there on my show, cool and calm and stoic-faced and evil during the commercial breaks, but laughing with a feigned buffoonery while on camera going, huh, huh, smoke it, kids, turn in, tune on, drop out, politics of joy. While he did that, a young girl was drowning in the stagnant pool at his hippie commune in Riverside, California, 17 years of age, overdosed on drugs, and he beat it out of town the next day. But meanwhile, he had 55 minutes of airtime in the second largest electronic media market in the world, LA, unchallenged, while I stood like a small boy being punished in the control room of the studio because I would have been too tough on him. Please remember that that pen is mightier than the sword. Please keep up your level of dedication and spirit. And in closing, I can only use one tragic story to point out to you what's happened just in four years in our country. Here's the headline of the major paper west of the Mississippi, the Los Angeles Times. And this headline is dated May 25th, 1967. And this story would not appear on the headline today because the paper has a point of view now that to put Hanoi in a bad light would be unfair because the country is going to go communist anyway in South Vietnam and therefore it's a waste of time to present any form of resistance to communism. We might as well cave in in this one case and see what area of the world they select next. And if they don't have that negative attitude, then they have the pro-Hanoi attitude that I've seen in the front pages of the New York Times when they take every phony little shred of communist negotiating trickery and blow it up into some great hope for world peace. But listen to this story and see if this doesn't renew your dedication. Sergeant Fritz was a good soldier. He had 17 years in the army. He probably gave them trouble and they made him pay and that payment was terrible. They captured the sergeant in a small Catholic church, took him and the wounded Marine Lieutenant that was with him out in front of the church, spread eagle the wounded sergeant on the ground face up and drove bamboo stakes through the palms of his hands and then killed him slowly with a crude version of the death of a thousand cuts. I want you to see that this is a headline, one of the major papers in this country. The young sergeant's Marine Lieutenant, part of the three-man advisory team serving with the 3rd Battalion, 1st Regiment of the 1st South Vietnamese Division had also been tortured. Burns were found all over his legs. He was made to kneel and watch the sergeant's torture and death and then was murdered by a shot fired through the right temple of his head that blew out the left side of his brain. Now that story really wouldn't get coverage today 
because the media has decided that we are the guilty ones in Southeast Asia. They give unbelievable airtime to a man from South Dakota, Senator McGovern, who says, quote, the only reason the war is going on is because we keep it going. In the third of my five trips to Vietnam, I was so impressed with the fact that a thousand young American kids had died there during my four-week visit that I started keeping track of my own personal list of how many kids were dying there on a weekly basis. It's a long list, and I don't just calculate the death of American citizens. And it's interesting that when you keep an accurate list like this, you can see that the Cambodian incursion, or invasion if you will, we weren't ashamed to call our going into France an invasion to drive out the German invaders, and the French people welcomed us as the Cambodian people did. The media didn't see it that way, speaking in general terms. But I also keep track of the young South Vietnamese boys that die. And they still die at the rate of 300 and 400 a week. And in spite of Jane Fonda, inanely saying that they're all taken into combat with a gun at the back of their head. I can tell you, having been in the field with their units, that they fight and die when they have good leadership, as well as young Americans fight and die when they have good leadership. And they fight and die at a heavier rate than our men have in any war in our history. But I also keep track of the deaths of the young North Vietnamese boys, where every man is missing in action where every man able to stand erect between the ages of 14 and 50 is sent down that Ho Chi Minh trail to some nameless grave, but which not one single prominent American news source in this country seems to think is immoral. They talk about the body count being a government lie and a distortion, and they totally reject the fact that General Jop his, who is both North Vietnam's Secretary of Defense and their commanding military officer combined, says that our body count figures are, to quote him exactly, exactly correct, that they have lost 750,000 men. And it seems that world opinion, taking the lead from our press in this country, is not going to have to focus in on the immorality of North Vietnam destroying the flower of its youth and of its middle age, but that they are going to be given some sort of victory out of the jaws of defeat because the people who control the communicative mediums in this country have decided that that's the way it should be. Please don't give up fighting. Please continue your dedication and please support those on the media who you feel are trying to bring some sort of truth into an almost impossible chaotic situation. Thank you very much for having me today.